Hey, thanks for joining me. It's Fred in Alaska. Uh, it's, it's been bitter cold lately and just, you know, staying warm or whatever. But uh, anyway, it's just some Alaska stuff. Um, what I wanted to share with you today comes from Brad. Um, Brad is his real first name. Uh, he asks his, you know, last name not be used, which is just fine. So Brad and his eight-year-old son at the time, this was back in 2004, so this was 20 years ago now, uh, going on 20 years anyway. Uh, his son was finally old enough to start getting out in the wilds with them, and at the time, uh, Brad had an amphibious uh, stall, I believe it was 185. And so amphibious means it has floats and wheels, and so he could take off from a runway and land in the lake, just for those who don't know. So he, he decides, okay, I'm going to take him out to, he had been, Brad had been up the Salter River a few times on a buddy's airboat or whatever, but uh, there, there's a whole lot of traffic of airboats up there nowadays where it's just hellacious, man. Um, there, there's so much sound pollution and those things are just worthless, in my opinion. In my opinion, people may love airboats, I think they're junk. Uh, anyway, you know. So he decides, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna go up in that area cause it's beautiful, but how do I go about it? So he starts looking on, you know, he's looking at maps and stuff and he decides he's gonna go up past the splits on the Salcha and go to the beginnings of the North Fork of the Salcha River and there's a cabin there. So he researched it. He flies out there alone one time, checks it out, makes sure he can, you know, it's it's accommodating enough for him to get in and out in the plane or whatever. And so he, he decides, okay, this is this is a spot. So he goes, does his thing, and he waits till after the hunting season to make the trip happen. Uh, just because of circumstances, he, he wanted to go sooner to when his son was, you know, not in school but it, it couldn't work out that way so he said screw it I'll, I'll take him out of school for a week and you know he's gonna go with dad well gets his gets everything planned out and he's over visiting with his uncle uh, uh brad has an alaska native background at the baskin and he had happened to be talking to his uncle uh about a week before his trip and he remembers his uncle telling him to beware of the hairy man and he thought his uncle was just giving him shit you know uh, he had heard of the hairy man he knows the oral tradition you know he he wasn't naive to it he just never experienced it and outside of his uncle hadn't known anyone in his family who had so he was just like all right uncle you know i'll keep that in mind and his uncle warned him if you hear his screams and stuff be aware keep your boy close you know you don't want to you know don't play yourself cheap you want to be aware and honestly, at the time, Brad said he was more concerned about bears versus some hairy man, you know, some some story. Yeah, and, and he, he believed his uncle, but he had never seen it, so it wasn't a reality to him. Now, he had planned on being there for a total of uh, approximately five days. And, you know, he went through the, the proper channels for all, all the reserving and all that kind of stuff, you know, because uh, a lot of times you got to reserve one of these state cabins just in case, you know, uh, someone had already reserved it or what, what have you. And so it was it was free and clear or whatever. He, he had gotten it. And his plan was to be there uh, four days, five nights, uh, a day of flying in, day of flying out, because he was trying to give his son the whole picture yeah you know, not just oh you know flying boom boom you're just right here he he flew around showing his son the sights and all that stuff which was great for his son now this experience i'm going to be sharing from his point of view and some of it from an eight-year-old's point of view that he remembers so um uh, i'll show on the map exactly where this place is right now and something to keep in mind this is it's remote alaska I anywhere you go remote alaska it is what it is man um you know you you got the whole gambit of grizzly bears moose whatever you know there's there's serious predators out there you know and anyway let me get back to it so he gets in there and he said the first night 
beautiful. Uh, he could see clouds coming, and according to what he was looking at and whatnot, uh, he had a satellite phone, and I mean that was outside of getting in his plane and firing up his radio and gaining altitude to reach somebody Th those were his forms of communication right he said that when they got there um he had pulled the plane in into a little bit of an eddy spot to where he could tie it off and it not be too pulled too hard by the current and potentially break a tree or a branch that it's tied off to and float away while he's sleeping i mean fair enough you know, the last thing you want is your expensive airplane floating away you know and happen god only knows what had happened to it but anyway so he gets there he gets everything done and he keeps his son right by him right and we'll just call him his son we, we won't even give him a fake name you know what i mean so him and his son they do their thing he's teaching them how to tie knots and, and just a total learning experience for his boy now they get up to the cabin and he said there's approximately three steps you go in there's a standard loft right in front of you. There's a wood stove off to the left next to a window. And off to the right was another window. And then you got two bunks in the back below the loft with a little table in between and a small window right there above it. So he came prepared. Um, he, uh, he brought a, a little DeWalt drill thing with the you know screws so he could hang up temporary curtains and whatnot. You know, just because. Uh, he he just didn't like the idea of open windows which hey i'm all for it you know i don't need to have something staring in at me anyway <laughs> he said the first night was great the when they got up the following morning while he was making breakfast it started raining like real hard and he was like crap you know he wanted to get his boy out and fish and he goes okay well we brought rain gear so i'm gonna rain gear him up we're gonna take this little trail that goes uh just up a little ways to the river's edge near where the plane was and follow the game trail a little further and there's a nice hole in the in uh, a hole meaning a, a deeper depression in the river where there's potentially some nice trout laying in there and whatnot so it's raining you know there may probably be more active so he he all right cool i got a game plan for me and the boy now as he's cooking this breakfast it's it's twilight it, it's twilight in the morning his son is asleep up in the loft just crashed out from all the excitement and travel and fresh air so <clears throat> as he's cooking he hears this clank tink 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 he's like what the hell is that he was like something must have fell off a, a, a branch off a tree or something fell onto the metal roof and rolled off okay no problem continues doing what he's doing and making up some bacon and eggs and stuff and some fried potatoes and you know he's using one of those little twin burner coleman stoves so he, you know he's doing his thing on that he just focused on cooking and again he hears clank 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 it's like what the hell is that you know and it's still fairly it's twilight on the horizon but still dark in the brush and so he's like well what the hell so he he, he steps around uh, he had the stove set up on one of the bunks if you're facing inside the door, he said it was over on the left-hand bunk, which is right near the wood stove and the window. The reason he didn't have it set right on top of the wood stove, it was it got a little chilly before bedtime, and he lit a fire in there overnight, and it was still a little warm, and he didn't want propane, and you know he, he was just avoiding excess heat and potentially a, a bad situation. So he said he went around, this little wood stove and looked out the window and all he saw was darkness in the trees light on the horizon he could see he could see the the mountain off to his left and you know it was trees off to the right and stuff and so he was like well, man you know I, I that's weird you know maybe the wind's blowing higher because of the rain and it's knocking pine cones it must be pine cones right so he he decides it's pine cones a little while later clink tink 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 and he's like man that's it sounds like a rock not a pine cone so now he his curiosity is really peaked because this is three in a row there's not really any wind there's more of a drizzly rain it's not like a, a you know a storm going on so he's really like what the hell so he's like all right grabs his gun he had a 4570 uh he had a 454 casul chest holster uh he wasn't playing any games he had dealt with bears in the past had some bad experiences and he said he had never be caught off guard with the bear again 
and fair enough. 4570 and a 454, you're, you're, you're doing all right. Especially when it comes to bears, right? So he goes out. He has a flashlight, uh, a real nice one. Uh, it was actually, uh, from what he said, it was a surefire weapon light. Right when they were coming out, they had some good ones. Even though the batteries didn't last long, they had some really good lumens, uh, you know, candela power. He goes out and he goes to the side to where the rocks were hitting, which would, if you're facing the cabin, it would be the left side, which he was on cooking and stuff where the stove was. He said when he got outside and went around, he was just using a flashlight panning around. He had the 454. And he said when he hit the tree line, it was about 25 yards away. He thought he saw dark movement and, and he couldn't. He wasn't sure. He It could have been a shadow from a tree, you know, with the light and stuff moving as he moved and stuff. So he was like, ah, you're, you're spooking yourself, right? But as he's outside, plink, tink, 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 comes another rock. And, and he turned when he heard and he watched the little rock. It was a river rock. Plink, fall off the roof, right? So now he's like, okay, something is throwing rocks. Who? And he, so he calls out. Keep in mind, his son's inside sleeping. He he yells out, hey, who's out there? Who's out there? And nothing. Dead quiet. Dead quiet. He can hear just the drizzle falling on the leaves and stuff. And so he, he gets this real weird, I'm being watched feeling. And so he goes inside. As he's going back to the door, he hears this weird grunt. Turns around. He's looking all around. You know, he's ready. He cocked the hammer on that pig and he was ready to go to business, you know, get down to business. And he, he sees nothing, you know, and it's it's limited distance. You know, he's got maybe 25 yards, you know, uh, of open visibility at most, not counting the little trail down to the river. And then there's a trail that hooks up going northbound to where he's tied off his plane. Now, he's really spooked. He goes back inside, calms down, shuts the door. Uh, one of the totes he had brought with, he just slides it in front of the door. You know, uh, he said the door, the latch was kind of wonky. And so he, he just, just to make sure it doesn't pop open or whatever, he was feeling real paranoid. And it was the first time he had felt that ever in his life. So he goes back tending to his food. It was kind of burning a little bit, you know, kind of smoking up the place. So he was like, crap, I'm going to have to open this door. And it's getting lighter. So he feels a little better about opening the door. So he opens the door. And he's, he's tending to his food and stuff so it doesn't get too scorched and he's salvaging what he can because he was outside for a couple minutes. He wasn't, you know, paying attention to his food and, you know, he's kicking himself at that moment. Brad said his son had woke up and came down the stairs, right? And so he was sitting over uh, on the bunk across from him where he had the little stove set up and stuff. And the other stove was cooled off enough, the wood stove was cooled off enough to where he felt comfortable moving that you know the the coleman stove over on top of it and again that he did not put a uh the small window in the back he did not put a curtain over because they were sleeping up in the loft he just wanted the the bigger windows covered right so as they're sitting there talking he's talking to his son about yeah it's burn a little bit bud but you know it'll be all right and he's like no worries dad so as he's talking to his son his son goes well who's that and he's like, who, he looks at the door, right? Immediately, who, what do you mean, who's that? Because he already had on his chest holster. You know, he had the 454 right there. And he looks towards the door, and he's like, there's no one out there, son. And he goes, no, in the window. And he turns, and as he turns to look in that little window, again, it's much lighter out now, he sees darkness move out and... Ugh. Ugh. He sees darkness move out, out of the way of that window. And, and immediately, all alarms are going off. He rushes over, slams the door shut, slows, you know, slides the tote over, and he's looking around, and he takes some of the firewood pieces and makes a makeshift board across the door lock on the inside. Now, hey, good MacGyvering. I, uh, me personally, it probably would have took me about 20, 25 minutes before I started looking to do that, but he, he said he felt like he needed to reinforce that door. <laughs> he did not go outside to look. He, everything felt off. He fixes the door, which takes time. He tells his son, just tell me if it looks, if you see anything else. And he waited until he had secured the door 
um, his initial tries weren't working and he knew he had stuff he could work with in the plane. So what he ended up doing is, is he got it started and everything and then he used three inch screws to screw through the door into the frame to reinforce it. So he put like, he said five or six and that was how he secured the door initially, right? So as this is going on, he said he was having friendly conversation with his son not talking about the topic of what was in the window even though he was dying to ask him right so he gets done doing all that and then turns around and says come over here son because he had him he had him at the edge of the bunk and there's this little uh it, it was built into the wall kind of thing it was like a small little table underneath that window to the right and not very big it, it, smaller than uh, like half the size of a card table and so he has his son over there and he's like so wh what was it you saw and he goes, you didn't see it, Dad? And he was like, no, son, I, I didn't see it. I, I saw something move, but I didn't see it. He goes, uh, someone with the fur hood on. And he goes, a fur hood? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, did you see his face? And he goes, no, all I saw was the fur hood. He says, okay, son. Well, someone's obviously playing a prank on us. And he goes, well, should, you know, I'm, I'm scared. You know, you're, you're, you're locking the door. You're putting screws through. You don't do that at home. You know, and the kids being curious, why are you doing this? And Brad was like, well, we're in a strange place. There's a stranger outside. I don't know what they want. And the, his son understood. Now, from his son's point of view, he was sitting there. And this is, this is his rough memory because he was eight at the time. It's 20 years ago. He said as he was watching his dad cook and his dad explaining, hey, I, I, I burnt some of this stuff or whatever his dad was carrying on about at the moment, something caught his attention at the window and he turns and looks and just sees this silhouette of what he referred to as a fur hood. It looked like a fur lined hood on someone's head and he couldn't see the face. Now, his son said that when that was going on, he had the urge to want to initially go outside and play but once his dad noticed and stuff it, it he said the mood changed for him he he felt scared inside um he said it was real weird he remembers vividly as a kid to feeling like oh it's playtime to all of a sudden dread you know and he never felt that before it, it was real real hard for him to understand as an eight-year-old so moving on as it got much, much lighter, Brad removed the screws from the door, had looked out the windows, nothing going on. He had his son stay inside while he did a little circle around the cab and saw nothing, right? Looked, looked for any kind of sign of anything, saw nothing. It was like, all right. They chill out until about, he said about, till about 10 a.m. in the morning. And then he said, all right, you know what? I'm, I'm armed. I'll keep my son close. We're going to go fish. He, he still... Uh, there there was a portion of him that didn't believe his own eyes with the dark movement. He thought maybe, you know, the high tension and the rocks and stuff was just like messing with him. You know, he was he was looking for easy explanations to what was going on around him. And, it, you know, he was just grasping at straws at that point. He, he was feeling uh, like his well-planned trip with his son was getting messed with, right? Which totally understandable. I mean, you can't account for that shit. So anyway, so he gets his son. It's day, it's drizzly. You know, he takes him up just past the plane, up along. It wasn't quite a quarter mile from the cabin, right? There was just enough river bank. They had brush behind them that was real thick. And he didn't care for that too much. There was a bunch of willows and stuff and, and, and poplars. He didn't care for that much at all. And but still, he let his son fish while he constantly kept kept watch, kept watch. So they started uh, they started noticing fish in the river moving up because the drizzle had stopped and it was it was you know just the river water moving. But wearing his polarized glasses, he was seeing fish movement moving up to a hole just a little further up. So he's like, "Hey son, let's move up a little ways, and we'll you know we'll get ahead of these fish moving upstream and then cast down." to him and you know real maybe catch something he, his boy was there for adventure so they they walked a little ways further 
and just before this bend in that river there's a little bit of an overwash spot so the the side of the river the cabin's on there's a bunch of overwashes from uh river ice that's getting uh basically a blockage from when it goes out it's it's an ice dam so the water will find another way and so that's why you see these teardrop shapes some bigger than others right and that's just from overflow from the ice when it's when it's retreating out in the spring and so they were there was a smaller one and there was brush and then a little bit of an old channel and then more brush so they had a straight line of sight with brush here straight line of sight and the thicker brush here and Brad was standing with the line of sight down that that overwash spot. His son was just right in front of him, 10 feet away, casting out, trying to catch fish. Well, as he's standing there, something catches his eye way off, way in the line of sight down this little, this little overwash spot to the opposite side of the riverbank, just slightly around the corner. He turns and looks, and he sees this black this black thing and he's looking and and something's off immediately he he stops and he's really focusing on it and he notices it just still as still and then he's kind of like awkwardly kind of cocking his head like what am i seeing cuz it was like the silhouette of a man but much bigger and it, it it in the context of what he was looking at just brush all around and everything all of a sudden there's this pitch black silhouette of a person right down over there about uh he said it was about 100 yards from from his position where he was at to across the river and to where it was and immediately he's like what the hell is that and at first he thought maybe maybe it's an old sign or something something put up you know because it wasn't moving it was this pitch black in there and he was trying to kind of explain it away in his own mind of what it could be and all of a sudden this thing bent down a little bit stood back up and then bolted out of view to his right and he was like immediately like what the hell because it moved and it was big and it just boom all of a sudden was just animated it went from static to animated like that and he was shocked but he didn't feel scared until he heard splashing in the water out of view around that bend immediately he just snatched his son up and retreated back to the cabin right he said as he was going along he left the fishing gear and stuff there uh he had his 454 and he had the 4570 slung over his shoulder but when he snatched his son his son dropped the fishing poles scared the shit out of the boy and he retreats right on back to the cabin right he said as he was going back to the cabin he could hear this thing moving back behind him off to his left back behind him he said it it, it was maybe 50 60 yards but it stayed pace with them but just back and so he's hearing this brush moving and you got to remember on uh, there's thick brush on that side on his left hand side it's just a wall of willows and stuff and so he can't visually see this but he can hear all the movement and the the brush rustling and stuff because the drizzling had stopped and it was just quiet so it was real easy to hear all that noise uh, he said it sounded like a freight train coming through there but it wasn't passing him or catching up to him it stayed at the same pace he was he said it it freaked him out uh, he said once they got past the plane and was back up to the little trail that goes up to the cabin he set his son down and and had his son stop and 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 sit down on the ground for a second because where he was there was an opening from one of those washouts from the river right there right near where he had the plane parked and he was waiting for this thing to show itself like come into the clearing so he could see it and he was standing there waiting with the 4570 because everything inside of him was like this ain't good this is not good well this uh because of overheating issues and stuff this is part one